Hello, everyone. Welcome to our master class by Professor Kelly Wilson from Indiana University. Uh, uh, my name is Ivan Shumkov. I'm CEO and founder of Build Academy. Build Academy is a platform for professional solutions and education in the built environment. We have a variety of online courses, programs, events, and master classes is the one that you are attending right now. Uh, most of what we do is online, so during this time of uh, coronavirus, it's, it's actually easy for you to join us and to witness what uh, we are doing. Uh, we have different uh, levels of membership, so if you are interested in learning more about what we do, I invite you to go to buildacademy.com and see what we are up to these days in terms of our programs, courses, and upcoming design challenges. We will be announcing a big challenge next week on uh, April 22nd, so stay tuned, and I will let you know more about it very soon. I would like to thank Professor Kelly Wilson, uh, my dear friend and, and colleague. I've known Kelly ever since I came to the United States 14 years ago. At that time, he was a professor at uh, Harvard University Graduate School of Design, and I was a student. And that's uh, how we met and we've been in touch ever since then. I really admire the work that he's doing as an architect, as a painter, artist and professor. So uh, thank you Kelly for agreeing to come to meet with us here. Uh, Kelly has been a professor at many different universities including Harvard, Columbia, Pratt. And for the last nine years he has been at the Indiana University, where he's currently director of the architectural program, which, was, uh, which has been recently established. And I will let uh, him speak more about this. Um, today's event is a masterclass in which we will have a discussion about two modern uh, and contemporary, actually, some of them buildings uh, in Columbus, Indiana, which is a city with uh, a lot of uh, incredible architecture that is not that well known for, for many of us. And so what Kelly will bring to us is his reading of the architecture of the city, and particularly to buildings, the El Sarin and First Christian Church and the IMP Public Library, uh, which are uh, in one of the main public squares in the cities. And we will see how they talk to each other, and how they talk to the public space and eventually why they're designed the way they're designed. The goal of this meeting is, is for those of us who are architects to learn something that would allow us to design better the buildings that we design. And for those of, of you who I know uh, many of you are not architects, it's an opportunity to gain some new skills and knowledge on how to read buildings. And we are all surrounded by buildings, we all live in buildings, but um, it's often really uh, difficult to understand why they are designed the way they are and uh, what the architects were thinking, uh, what they mean for the people who design them and for the people who use them, and in general, how they communicate to us. Architecture has an incredible power and, and uh, influence on the way we feel, and therefore, with the buildings that uh, we are we live in or we are we are witnessing uh, we can actually change the consciousness of people we can change the way they feel they think and therefore today we'll see how these uh, tools are applied to these masterpieces and i'm really excited to welcome professor kelly wilson to our meeting and uh, thank you kelly for your precious time and for sharing your wisdom with all of us uh, thank you, Ivan. I'm glad to join. And uh, I want to give a shout out to an old friend, Alan Hing, that I see sitting in his apartment. I wore a talk with at Auburn University. And to my Columbus cohorts, I see two of my colleagues from the Columbus Creative Community and Aaron Hawkins and Karen Iverson with us. And to two new colleagues from IU, uh, Ting, uh, uh, Ting Ting and uh, uh, Jay Ling, thank you for joining this talk. Uh, and uh, I promised you a tour of this building of the space and now you can get it. So let me start my share screen and we'll start with our keynote. Okay, 
First, introducing myself, that's me in front of uh, the Colosseum and uh, one of the great triumphal arts in Rome. I'm an architect uh, and an artist. I work on buildings like these you see on the screen, which are renderings I also do with my own hand. Uh, various uh, architects that I've worked with, with Coder Kim, I am Pei, Marlon Blackwell, and many more. Uh, I'm also a visual artist. I draw, the, the, you see a great piece of ruin in Rome. I paint uh, New York when I get the chance, lower Manhattan, and these days in the winter, confined to my studio, uh, uh, I do still lives. I'm located here in the middle of the United States in a city in Indiana called Columbus. It's home to about 50,000 people and also a remarkable collection of modern architecture. In the downtown area alone, there's at least a dozen buildings that are extraordinary examples of contemporary modern architecture with the first building in 1938 by Eliel Sarna, which I'll talk about today, which is the upper left-hand corner of this slide. We sit in the Republic Building, itself on the National Historic Register of Important Buildings, designed by I.M. Pei's structural engineer uh, uh, at SOM, uh, Myron Goldsmith. And in our program, where we make outrageous things, it's one of the largest 3D uh, printed sculptures in North America, and we combine architectural design education with studio art education. Uh, we do two studios simultaneously for every semester in our master's program. Uh, we're located here in the southwest corner of the city of Columbus. Close proximity to us is this remarkable composition of two buildings. You see the library by I.M. Pei from 1966 sitting on the north side of Fifth Street, and on the south side is the 1938 building by Eliel Saarinen, First Christian Church. Now, it's important to know that before I am Pei's edition came, that this library uh, sat on this site, a Carnegie Library, that was actually removed to make room for the I am Pei Library for the Columbus, for the Bartholomew County, Bartholomew County, uh, uh, Bartholomew County Library System, and it's in the name of uh, Cleo Rogers as a memorial library. Now, this is Columbus from a photograph from the uh, 20s uh, that shows prior to the library edition by Pei, even prior to the edition of uh, uh, Saranen's Church, you get some idea of the image of the town. And as we approach the site in question, uh, from that angle, the first thing we see tends to be this Henry Moore sculpture that pops up along the sidewalk. Most people will look at objects of architecture uh, as objects. They'll look at this house, which Mr. Miller, uh, the CEO of Cummins and uh, founder of any of the, of the architectural uh, program that Cummins started to help get modern architecture into the city, uh, was raised and lived here. Or you might stare at the, this building, which is the First Christian Church by Ella Saarinen, and you might look at it and say, well, isn't it odd? It has a cross that's not in the center of its facade. Huh, what's up with that? Then the clock on the tower is slightly shifted to the left, a clock, not a cross. And at the bottom, the door of the tower seems in empathy to have shifted to the right. And what's with that big staircase that goes sweeping to the left to go to a little wall on the side where there's a bench that no one hardly ever sits? What's up with this? And over there, the library itself has an enigma. What is that vast Sahara of brick doing in the middle? It looks like someone took a belt sander and just buzzsawed the facade off of any ornament. And these corners, they're cut out. They're innies, not outies. What's up with that? What a blank, strange facade. How almost empty. And those corners again. Why did the architect choose to do this? Not normal to most corners. Why was this? Was this hubris on behalf of an architect or is there an intention? Now, and then finally the Henry Moore sculpture, which sits on its site and people stare at it. But look, its location is way off to the left when it is most commonly understood that monumental statues tend to seize the most opportunity they can with the plazas they're gifted to by grabbing the center, like these. Each one of these statues tends to employ some kind of 
recognition of a centering or to be exercised on the axis of an important building, a street, or a plaza. But not this one. What are we to think of these things? How do we answer these questions? So when I engage a building and how I try to teach it is that we look at a buildings and their problems and these questions about how to answer why a cross, for instance, one of the most powerful symbols you could stick on a building bar none. It wouldn't matter how big or how small or where you put it, it says, I'm Christian. Why is it as big as it is? And why is it exactly where it is? What has this got to do with how an architect designs every element to be in a meaningful dialogue with another one? To solve these problems, I look to answer those questions in the round. I look between buildings and across to see if there are linkages between them that substantiate why they're where they are. So three questions I offer you guys to help understand whether something in front of you is arbitrary or intelligent when you come to face it. The first, is there any order to the context surrounding our subject because it might be linked? Two, is there any order to the use of materials or is it arbitrary? And three, is there any order to perception itself? What I see and from where I see it from. Now of our site, as mentioned, that statue sits decidedly not in the center of its plaza. Worse, it's not even proper to the street, it's rotated. What are we to make of this? Again, is this hubris or is this intelligence? How are we to figure that out for ourselves? Now, it can be compared to another famous statue in another famous space, which is the statue of Marcus Aurelius and the Campidoglio in Rome. In fact, I.M. Pei's first sketch for the library had this very design put in the center of the imaginary plaza as a kind of placeholder as he was inventing the plaza. His partner, Harry Cobb, who passed away just recently, did tell me that uh, I.M. designed the building and its space all by himself and the building only took a very short amount of time to do. It was the plaza he struggled with. And what I'm about to show you, which took me about three months of analysis when I first got to Columbus and found this remarkable thing, I'm about to share with you here. Now, there's a statue in the center of the space, although I will point out it kind of isn't. It's slightly forward between the two connecting primal portals of the two flanking buildings, but certainly in the center of its oval and on axis with its stair, Although it's interesting to note that the tower you see at the right hand slide doesn't line up, which is another lecture altogether. There's the space that it sits in, in the city. And you might think that route stops, but I'm showing you the library plaza above and the Campidoglio below. And it's important to realize that even the Campidoglio had a path that went through it. It was one of the nine paths you see color coded, discovered by Alan Seen, a cartographer of Rome. Uh, that describes a significant symbolic passageway when the Pope travels from St. Peter's to St. John the Lateran, and he passes through the Campidoglio as a sequence. Important are paths. This is primary to understanding architecture. That yellow line in the city of Manhattan is Broadway. The long crooked street of New York, which is laid out mostly in grids. And the reason it's there as an angle, it was an Indian footpath. It was the first pathway on the Isle of Manhattan. Roads come first, buildings come second. Our plaza in question, the one between these two buildings, is bisected by a street called Fifth Street. Interestingly, it's preceded by open space on the left, open space on the right, open space on the left, open space on the, it's a cadence of open spaces, left, right, left, right, on a street that also has a concluding park and a Cummins factory. It's one of the few streets in Columbus that actually has a design. As we walk down the street, you'll notice that the three towers, which is the old city hall, first Christian bell tower, and uh, St. Peter's uh, uh, Lutheran church, tend to link the eye from one to the other, which helps our eye gallop down the street, which is a kind of lovely idea. And we can, from the plaza, four other towers can be seen from its center. But that doesn't explain why the statue is not in the center of its plaza. Now, to analyze this, we look at the boundaries surrounding the library, the statue itself, and those yellow lines represent the physical boundaries of the building of space that's shaped by surface, vertical surfaces. Landscape tends to reinforce this. 
And interestingly, there's this planter that sits on the side, that upper left-hand image, where uh, often with planters, I often don't like those things, like you see them in airports, like they're, they're growing potatoes up there. I, I can't go stand in it. I would look conspicuous. Uh, what are they for? And you might see that here, the edge that it produces, that new yellow line, puts the, uh, the statue kind of in a new center. So the statue is simultaneously in a center and not at the same time. It also happens to be equidistant between the surface of the library and the surface of First Christian. Interestingly, a piece of that plaza floor, which has been isolated by the library, the sidewalk concrete, invading the, plot, the library floor, isolating a piece of the library floor, is slipped past the edge of the carpet and interrupts the continuity of the sidewalk. This is the first hint that there's a dialogue going on between these buildings. How compelling that by isolating that plaza floor, it converts the concrete by going around it, converts that plaza into a pedestal for the sculpture. It's a beautiful, very clever move by Mr. Pei. Now the two objects on the site, the statue and the tower, let's answer some of the questions on this site. Let's start with this first object. Now, as mentioned, that library seems to have a vast surface of blankness right in the middle that looks as if it's waiting for the name Bartholomew County Public Library, thank you everybody, belongs right there. Why is it so pregnantly empty? Well, there's an answer. If you walk down Lafayette Street towards the library from the side of First Christian, you can see that the statue has been placed exactly where the alignment of the street with the sculpture, with the building, links the eye from the street to the sculpture to the building. Even as we walk down the length of the street, the statue stays within that panel until you hit the intersection, your eyes on something else, and the statue finally breaks out of that panel. The point of this is to demonstrate that the unique silhouette of the statue is made very clear by the blank background so that its unique silhouette is not in competition with the shapes to the left or to the right, thereby linking the street to the sculpture to the building. And of the tower, the other object, well, the library has two entrances. This is the primary entrance from the plaza, and there's a secondary entrance you see below, which is original, which is the children's entrance, uh, a way to let a child enter a, the library because they're noisy and not interfere with the main floor. Well, that staircase you see that exits out of the children's entrance towards the significance of a parking lot where moms pick up their kids all day long and drop them off, this remarkable alignment occurs. The tower, the bell tower, is made of the same material and apparent width as the sidewalk. And the two sides of the buildings, up between the library and the church, though neither are in the same plane or the same height, appear to be so, linking the two sides in a pas de deux of relationships. Now, this observation was made by Jennifer Riley, my wife, who helps me teach Rome. And as we turned the corner one day, she pointed this out, and to my excitement, I thought, my God, if it's doing that on this side, what's it doing on the other side? So here, at least our two objects are linking themselves from significant pathways of approach to join or stitch across Fifth Street. And this is a key. I want to discuss materiality for a second, the order material. You take all that brick, it goes down the steps and across the plaza. It links the plaza to the facade in such a way that you could say, am I a folded piazza or am I a folded facade? And both would be true. But here, these two uh, elements, the floor and the facade, are linked to each other by the continuity of material. So when you stand on that brick, you know you're in the library plaza itself. And even the concrete that was existing on the first Christian side from 1938, the addition of the concrete and the width of it on this side was meant most probably to link to that material on the other side. And what are these corners? These huge negative corners that were our, our characters and hallmark of this building. Well, when I don't know how to answer my own questions, when I am trying to sleuth out a building, I turn 
to the idea, why don't we just put them back as normal? And so with Photoshop, I simply filled in the corners and asked myself, is it better or is it worse? Which is better? What does it do? Can I shock myself into discovering what it's doing? And when it's this way, I feel the figure or form of the building more clearly. And as when I cut out the corners, it's more of a surface. So I'm able to realize, ah, oh, I get more of a billboard or two dimensional surface because of those cutouts. Well, then you apply the so what rule. How does that link to another idea? Well, that plane on that building tends to animate the plane of trees that stretches across the street of this street, linking the two sides together like this. And a row of trees lined up with the facade of First Christian go straight across and line up with the row of trees on the other side. You see they're young, they, they grew old, we replaced them shortly, building the figure of space. You realize what Pei is saying is that I don't want you to feel the form of my building. I want you to feel the form of public space I just generated with Mr. Saarinen's facade and the trees on both sides. Now, Lafayette Street, which I had mentioned before, runs this way, north and south in our city. The library interrupted the continuity of the street, a thing you have to be very careful of doing. It's, it's like cutting a, a vein out of the body. The continuity of movement and the blood of the city is stopped and arrested for a moment. Now, Mr. Pei, when he did this, he at least that red line represents the continuity of the sidewalk, both photographs, one's looking south and one's looking north. So it link, he allowed the continuity of at least the little street, the sidewalk, to pass through his site. Now, that means you're in a thin urban space on what would be the east side of the library, approaching a wide urban space. Now, to any good designer, they would know this anticipates a threshold. Uh, thresholds are important. This is the way in which we make the transition from one thing to another in design. Uh, the threshold in all forms of design, but in architecture and urbanism, uh, they're significant. It's like um, why motels are lousy. You open a door and there's the bed. There's no transitional space. Well, knowing this and also thinking about that cutout corner and how good the sidewalk was on the west side of the building, what was I to discover? walking down this side. So whenever architecture gives me access, I walk down it, it's for us after all. And as I approach the corner, this small miracle occurs. The building edge cutout corner tends to inframe something in the distance, pulling it into my cone of vision and making me link to it. Building the threshold anticipation of walking into that plaza. And in fact, the minute I break the plane and step into the plaza, from this angle, the statue is not only frontal to my gaze, it's organized on the off-center component of the facade on First Christian. The cross and the three doors are squarely located in the center. It's very clear what was happening. And as you walk up to the building, there's the money shot of Columbus. The arch itself captures the basilica with the lower spur and captures the tower with the higher arc. That's three moments of what's called perceptual order in architecture. What I see from where I see it to make a cadence and linkage. And it would seem that the goal to all these maneuvers that I'm describing is to solve a problem, which was in the United States, in America, streets divide things. Mr. Pei was trying to build a public space out of the linking of the library to the north, to the church to the south. Fifth Street interrupted it. These linkages were meant to make a consilience, a unity between urban design, the street, landscape design, the trees, art, which is the monumental sculpture of Mr. Moore, and the architecture of those two buildings to pull our eyes across Fifth Street so that we don't make the mistake of thinking that Fifth Street had divided two spaces. Mr. Lafayette, we may have ruined your street, but we sure gave your sidewalk a shot in the arm. From inside the library, this remarkable thing happens. The texture of the ceiling, a waffle grid, relates to the texture of the grid on the facade of First Christian. And the portal of the library itself is in fact the same proportion. 
is that of the library facade. Again, another linkage that binds these two buildings together and talks about a much greater dialogue between one building and another to amplify and locate themselves. There's even borrowings of a very interesting kind. The three windows you see on the left that belong to the library appear like doors because there's no bottom sill. Now it's glass and it's a window, it's not a portal, but they are sort of a distant echo of the three doors that sit in the facade of First Christian, kissing cousins. Architects don't borrow literally from one element to another. They look at one, they transform it slightly, and they pull it over. In fact, both buildings sit on podiums that links them even further. Now, something that was wonderful to discover is that those narrow slit windows in the library facade are the same proportion as the tower. Another form of visual linkage between two buildings. And what can we say of that facade itself? In a facade design that Mr. Saarinen, there's the actual center of the facade. The cross is firmly to the, to the right. Although it is located on the center of the three doors, we call that a local ordering in architecture. And if I use what I know from having studied art and understanding the power of enframement and how we group and frame and make relationships within the boundaries of our drawings and our paintings. If I link the corner of the building through the center of the cross, my line is extended and finds the edge of the building where the limit of that additional wall, which holds an egress there, not something very important on the inside, it's an egress there. Now, rectangles are very powerful in architecture. Uh, because they have centers and because they have very powerful corners. They call it visual sharpening. Squares are even stronger than rectangles. And if you can find that square, it animates another square lurking under the right armpit of the cross. Now, squares are powerful because they have emphatic centers. This center band of panels drops into the rectangle that holds the three doors which are off center, but on center with the cross. You see where I'm going? Mr. Saarinen had placed his elements in his facade to link them by rhythmic geometries to build more tension and more movement and more power than by arbitrarily locating them. In fact, there are another few other surprises to this. The center, the actual center of the church is here. If I take the two bays, we call them bays, units of measurement, and I extend it one more time, I find that it lands exactly where the tower is located. He's trying to say that that bell tower is not arbitrarily located somewhere to my right. It's part of the cadence of my facade. And if I draft a line, I'm doing this because I'm the kind of designer that wants to know why is the tower as tall as it is? From the, and I draft that line from the edge of that small wall, and I draft a line from the top of the tower, and where they intersect, if I construct a line to pass through the right-hand corner of the facade we have used before, to our utter delight, we find that it lands exactly at the bottom right-hand corner of the tower. This generates a super surface, a monumental facade, how to express monumentality without mass so that you feel the power of something and how appropriate for a church where the larger portion of our person isn't in our corporal form, it's in the presence of our souls. Other buildings do this. This is not alone in Columbus. This is the Taj Mahal. And by the unique perspective from the entry portal, you discover a very powerful triangle is composed between the entrance portal at the bottom and the towers in perspective, building a frontal plane that composes a very powerful two-dimensional shape that gives monumentality and presence to the Taj, which is actually a very small building. If I were to take the clock, which is off center, to further this investigation, and I put a dot in the center of the clock and pass it through the corner of the building, I'll hit the center door below the cross, which animates the power of the three, the width of the three panels, and to my utter shock, discover that those three things were the same width, the little wall to the left and the width of the tower. 
tripartite, important to the symbolism of church. That animates the opening of the entrance lobby itself, which rediscovers the square, which finds the rectangle, which links the composition together. Rhythmically linking geometries bind the elements together to make a gestalt, something stronger than the mere sum of their parts. And in one final interesting perceptual ordering, I discovered when we walk towards the middle of the plaza, aligned with a statue to our side, and we stare at First Christian, this unique thing happens. The canopy over the entrance, which is copper trim on plaster, which is the same detail to the left of the entrance on the little wall, shares the exact same detail for the school wing, which is original, which is two stories high, which is in the background. And a bar is generated. I'll go back and point out that the top riser to the stairs lines up with the bottom of the two-story wing, which is a limestone element that is the same shape as the riser itself. And it tends to build a visual bar that goes across the entire site, which is the tower turned sideways. Another way to express monumentality without mass. Now, this is the opposite of what happens in art, which is trying to send space back and forth in a drawing. I'm using this particular uh, 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 drawing of a New England marsh that shows what would happen if I removed the haystacks that go back in the distance. It tends to put all the energy to the haystack to the left, the sail, the sail, the, uh, the sail on the sailboat in the middle, and the haystack to the right. If I put them back, it tends the eye to go back along with the geese that are flying off in twilight. If I remove them, it compresses the page. Now I've been discussing visual compression in the way architecture works. I teach my students this. This is examples at Harvard uh, where I taught the GSD years back where I asked students to take a long hallway, put tape in it to compress, they're using uh, painter's tape, to build a design to compress the space of the long hallway. And they would come up with examples like this. Or if you would see this on the floor, uh, in the GSD, the grad school design, you'd be standing in the wrong place. But if you stood in the right place, it would do this. Likewise, this is a, a very long hallway where students were able to build completely flat designs and to recognize that the tape that's on the wall actually is climbing the wall as it goes further back to counteract perspective and diminution. That is, shapes getting smaller as they go back in distance. That's what the tape has to look like to build that. And they make marvelous things. They thought the dean needed a balcony at the GST. Or they invent spectacular spaces that are almost impossible. Uh, they even make them kinetic. The elevator door opens and the square jumps back. So these are exercises to teach students the art of visual compression, how to compress distant things together so they make recognizable shapes that A, in visual perception, the linkages between things. In fact, I'll relate this to a drawing by J. M. W. Turner called The North Gallery at Night. Now, Turner was a very remarkable artist and quite talented, and I'm going to describe what he's doing in this painting is not dissimilar to what I was trying to explain, which happens between First Christian Church and I. M. Pace Library. Hey, and now Turner, uh, at this time, he's at, this is a Lord Egremont's uh, mansion uh, in, in, in the uh, south of London, uh, where he uh, had retreated after the death of his father. He lived there for two years. Lord Egremont was a, a patron of uh, J.M.W. Turner's and bought much of his early work, actually start, helped him start his career. While he stayed in the manor house of uh, Petsworth, is the name of the manor, he made over 300 drawings of the life and character of life inside of big, busy English manor house. One of these is one of the most remarkable of all that he made of the manor house, this one, the North Gallery at night. What I find so compelling is how to explain a lot of the composition of this, uh, of this painting. Now, the art lovers have an arm raised and are gesticulating in the direction of the statue, which is also the direction of the light that seems to be streaming in from the right-hand corner in this way sort of linking one side of the page through to the other past the statue, which tends to divide the page into two halves because it's such a powerful vertical element within a composition. Now, 
those three windows are unusual. They seem to be descending in an arc, which is very strange because we know this building is a neoclassical building and this is not designed by Frank Gehry with compound curves. They shouldn't be dipping like that. And it gives us at least two interpretations where the corner of the back room of that watercolor painting is. One is by way of the ceiling, this is the top slide, and one is by way of the shift in angles between the three lunette windows on the left and the one lunette window on the right. What are we to make of the fact that he did this? Well, one of the discoveries is to learn that every shape has a centroidal axis in a drawing. It has, just because it's a shape doesn't mean that the power of its influence doesn't migrate through the rest of the painting. So by drafting a line perpendicular to the sill of each lunette, you find that it tends to hit each of the characters that are below. Even if the characters to the right are ghostly figures sitting at, some at, a, at a chair at a table. Now, again, through Photoshop, I thought what I would do is straighten the windows out according to what an architect would actually render it as. And if I straighten the corner out like this or like that, I get my two corrected perspectives. But interestingly, when corrected, this happens. The energy and the focus and the drive of the perspective tends to take my attention to the rear of the painting where exactly nothing is happening. So by flattening, compressing, making ambiguous the corner in the rear, he's compressing the rear of his page, bringing it close forward to make all the energy be up at the front where our figures are all located. I call it the advancing wall of modernism in early art. So thank you. That is my short brief on Columbus. And uh, uh, Yvonne, if you want to ask some questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sure, thank you so much, Kelly. This was spectacular. I, I've never actually seen myself a reading of a building as, as the one you did today. It's, uh, and, and when I go to Columbus someday, I'll definitely spend a lot of time walking around the buildings and, and going through them. Um, I'm wondering whether this is a method that you can apply to any building and whether you can um, recommend to our audience how can they apply this kind of uh, reading to anything that they see because obviously every public space in our cities is designed by someone with certain intentions. So how, what's your secret? Like, how do we, <laughs> how do we learn this and how do we apply it ourselves? Uh, most people are taught to look through lenses ground for them by their teachers and they never learn to take their glasses off to look for themselves. It was probably due to the influence of having learned as much as I could about drawing and painting from people like Bill Gwynn and Flora Natapoff, where I learned to see and see deeply in the act of learning visual order and visual structure to the way in which we draw, how, why we draw and why we make a composition work or not work it has a lot to do with how we visually order things. Architecture partakes in this. Architecture is a set of visually embodied ideas. And so learning to look and how to use your eyes to link things is an important ingredient to, uh, uh, to sort of learn to see for yourself. So those three questions I thought were very useful in my own education uh, had to do with being in Rome for so many years and wondering why some of these buildings and spaces and streets were so amazing. And I found just by asking those three questions, uh, uh, how, where are materials, where do they go? Do they make a pattern, are they repeated? Or the materials arbitrary? Uh, and whatever I'm looking at, am I standing somewhere, seeing something because I'm standing in a significant spot, like a threshold between things that links things together? Or whenever I go to analyze something like the statue, I had to look at the entire context and walk around the building in order to find how to answer a design problem. Mm -hmm. So like a great piece of art, something way up here in a corner is actually talking to something at the other corner because the author composed them to be in dialogue with each other. So I look for relationship building when I enter a site to answer questions about design. Absolutely, thank you. Um, 
another thing, well, I would invite our guests actually to, I have many questions that uh, I could ask and I'm so curious about these projects, but I would invite our guests to actually ask questions either by turning on your microphones or by writing them in the chat below. If, uh, if someone has any ideas, now it's a good time to, to ask. Uh, I, I do have a question. Um, this is Michael. It is. Yeah, thank you. That, that was uh, fantastic, by the way. And I haven't had a chance to see these buildings myself, but um, now I feel like I have a little bit. When you discover these kind of relationships in geometry, et cetera, do you, does it matter to you whether they were intentional um, as the architects designed it or whether they are um, accidental. I mean, the fact is that they exist. The relationship exists. Are they so obvious to you that, that you think they are necessarily all of them intended? That's a great question, Michael, and one my students ask me <laughs> all the time. Uh, here's the way I answer that, is that what we're doing actually is uh, the art of conjecturing. And so when I take our students to Rome or on the nomadic studio where we travel to uh, countries uh, in uh, cities in sequence around the world in our program, and it's a sketchbook they've got in front of them, they're told to draw stuff, draw the buildings, they're looking at the spaces, and then because of what they drew, what can they say? And you're trying to make them make, them make a number of formal, formal observations, which are facts, and then string them together to make a meaning for themselves. Now, did the author intend that? It's hard to say, as uh, some of my colleagues or architectural historians would say, the author is the last person you go to to find out what it's about. <laughs> the truth is, you have, as a designer, you learn hundreds and hundreds of moves when you design something. And as you're designing, they're all swimming back and forth, taking different senses of hierarchy and importance. And when it's all over and you've got a design, when you go to present it to someone, you don't describe everything you thought of, you describe a few things that you thought might have been central to inspiring the others. I'm the kind of architect or artist that looks at something and like a vacuum cleaner, I suck up every move that was had to have been thought about to solve that problem so someone could draw it up and solve it to a detail. And then I reorganize it to make a meaning for myself. And if I can make a logic out of it, if it makes sense, I've just found something for myself. Can I attribute it to the author? It's hard to say. Now I do know that in the case of that statue, a mock-up was made and it was sort of rolled around like on a lazy Susan until it presumably hit all these bells. Uh, and it's because the statue was originally designed to be in the center of a much larger space, uh, which was not only was Lafayette Street meant to be stopped, which it was, Fifth Street was meant to be stopped. And I guess public outcry prevented that from happening. Mr. Pay had to redesign his plaza. I think it's much better for that reason. Uh, Michael, I hope that answered your question. It, it does. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly and Michael, for your... Michael, thanks for your question, Kelly, for the answer. So we have a few more questions from Julie Tao. She says, thank you very much. This is very interesting. Do you have any other lectures like this, analyzing other areas of buildings, maybe even books? Well, the book is going to come out through IU Press on uh, a number of these buildings. I believe there's... Uh, Ah, there's 70 of these things in this city. That's the shock of Columbus and why we argue we have the largest architectural design campus in the United States, because we have all these buildings that we use that we teach our students with. Uh, so there's quite a few and they, yes, they are, I have more lectures that do this. Uh, and art, I, uh, uh, and in Rome, my God, I've been studying that city for 25 years. Uh, it's, 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 um, it's littered with these kinds of uh, uh, design moves throughout that city. It's where I learned to see these things, actually, it was in Rome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I have, I have to say I've never seen a, an analysis like this, a visual analysis of a building like this. And, and probably your, your skills and, and work as a painter are extremely helpful in, in decoding these buildings. Uh, as, as an architect, I tend to look at the plan of a building, a section of a building, and you know, it's more like the volume of a building, materials. But you know, the the kind of reading that you did in uh, in the surfaces and the geometries and the proportions is something that uh, would have never occurred to me by looking at these buildings. So this is uh, pretty impressive. Um, 
I have to, uh, oh, there's another one uh, from Carlos, Carlos Burton says, great presentation, love some concepts, how they were presented like distant compression, perceptual order. The presentation itself was like an IMP design, thanks. <laughs> So I, I wanted to, so if, if someone else has, uh, has questions, I invite you to, to continue with them now. And meanwhile, I wanted to ask Kelly whether you can extend this analysis to uh, the, somehow to the space and to the interiors of the buildings themselves. Well, I'm pretty do. sure. Fact, there's I'm a wonderful critique inside First Christian, uh, which interestingly, it's, it's a uh, basilica type church. And then as an historian, you would know, all basilicas have a long nave and two shorter side aisles in plan. This has only one side aisle. It's the first one-armed bandit basilica in the history of basilicas, which is a kind of shock. Why did Saarinen perpetrate this invention? And the other is that on the inside of the church, the, the monumental wall, the, the apse where we would stare at a Bernini or the Michelangelo, last judge, or you know, the, the, we're all looking at the apse anyway from our axial link uh, in, a, in, a, in a Roman Basilica church from the second century forward. Uh, the monumental wall is not at the end wall in Saren's hand, it's in the side wall where he'd removed the uh, side aisle, which does the job. Uh, There's a, a tour de force of wonderful visual, architectural dynamics inside, inside of uh, First Christian and also inside of the library by MP. And something we need to, to mention about this church is the interior, or the furniture at least, was designed by Eero Saarinen, who is the son. Eero Saarinen is the famous, uh, probably one of the most famous American architects of the 20th century. Uh, his, last, uh, his last building, North Christian Church, was uh, built in Columbus which, in the early 70s. Which is the one we see on the right, if I'm not mistaken, right? No, that's, uh, that's uh, Gunnar Burkett's. Oh, so it's uh, a different one. Church. Right, right. So, right. so it's... And across okay. the street, you see a square and a circle. That's Gunnar Burkitt's as well. I've, so. I've seen pictures of it. I just wasn't sure where it's located in the city. So, so the interior was designed, or the furniture at least, was designed by Eero Saren. Yes, Saren. And some, so of the, this was, uh, some of the interior relationships were designed by Eero as a young man working for his father. Yeah, pretty, pretty impressive. So, and um, can you tell us a bit more about maybe the background of these uh, buildings, like how they why they decided to build them or what, what happened well, when, this, they, the, when the they invited most, these architects yeah. to Columbus, because it's pretty amazing that Columbus attracted such a star system of the time. So first Christian, which is in the south side of uh, the horizontal street going across the slide, which is Fifth Street, uh, was the first modern church in the United States and also one of the, fir the first modern building in Columbus itself. What had happened is that the young Mr. Miller, who grew up in the estate, you see surrounded by trees to the west of the library and the west of the statue, excuse me, the east of the statue, the right-hand side, uh, was returned from Yale, where he's an uh, undergraduate studying art history, and his parents were grousing about the fact that Gilchrist, the architect out of Philly, had had a nervous breakdown and would not be designing and building the church that was to occupy that site, which was a sort of Gothic pile. And so he sort of said, mom, dad, why don't you go talk to Mr. Saren? And he's right up there in Dearborn Hills, Michigan. And you should be looking to the modern like this. And that, if I, I'm paraphrasing this conversation and probably botching it, uh, people know this conversation better than I do. Uh, they traveled to Dearborn Hills to meet uh, Mr. Eliel Saren, the father of Arrow. And uh, someone talked him into coming to Columbus and uh, executing this church which wasn't going to happen at first. He was not interested in, in, uh, in doing it, but they, he was talked into it. He came and decided this was a good community to build a church, design a church for. Uh, the church was erected. It started in 38. It was finished in 42. And even at one point when the steel was up, the U.S. War Department during World War II came to see if they should be taking the steel away for the war effort and decided at the last minute they wouldn't. So the church survived because of that. It nearly, it nearly didn't have a chance. So with that building uh, and uh, the return of the young Mr. Miller to Columbus to run the Cummins Diesel Engine Company, uh, Clessy Cummins was a chauffeur for the Irwin Miller Sweeney family uh, and had been experimenting with Mr. Diesel's uh, engine, solving something Mr. Diesel couldn't, which was to heat the fuel prior to uh, ignition in a uh, diesel engine, didn't need a spark plug. 
he, the, 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 the success of the company uh, uh, was due to Mr. Miller. And he also knew that to, to attract really good executives to this, to this business, uh, he would have to also contribute to helping think about the community and what kind of city it was. And so the one place he could intervene and help with all these returning GIs and the baby boom was to help in the education area of Columbus. And uh, he offered a one-time deal. This is according to his, his, uh, his son uh, 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 that said that, that the uh, Schmidt School was a middle school that was needed a building. They were going to build a new building called Schmidt School. And uh, Mr. Miller proposed the idea to the school, the, the education board, that I'll pay for the fees of the architect you choose, but with one caveat, that you choose that architect off a list of six people I give you. And once you choose them, I'll have nothing to do with it. It's all yours. Uh, it was meant to be a one-off deal. Just do this once. And of course, Mr. Miller had gone to Eliel Saran and said, give me six young architects that in 35 years from now will be great. Which is a very interesting question. He didn't. And they said, we couldn't get the big guys to come. The interstate hadn't been built. This is, this is before the interstate system. And because uh, it's 1952 or something. And... Uh, and a young, hungry, interesting architect, you know, uh, is what we, we would come out and do it. So he paid, placed his first future in the hands of young architects. Uh, the miracle of the thing, and it was Harry Weiss that got chosen that did the project. It, it was so successful that the school board came back to Mr. Miller and said, can we do it again? And that's when he started the foundation where they took a, some of the profits from the engine company, put it into a foundation, and for any public building in the city of Columbus could apply to the foundation, for this, uh, this helping hand. And that's the amount of money that was put into that program and was spent in architecture since the uh, 50s forward uh, was a fraction of the money that got spent on modern architecture. None of those churches are public. They're not, they, they're private essentially. And so uh, the houses and a lot of other buildings that are of the modern iconography of, of Columbus's great architecture were a consequence of people sort of being inspired by what they saw with the school buildings and trying to get that into other buildings that we're building, which is kind of wonderful. Fantastic. Thanks, Kelly. So we have a few, actually three more questions that just came. Uh, the first one is, what's the title of your upcoming book and when will it be available? Uh, <laughs> I don't have a title. I, I, I wish I had a title. It's, I've got all got a bunch and uh, it's probably uh, another two years out between getting, uh, uh, who knows, with the coronavirus and the uh, number of things we're trying to get published at the moment, but uh, hopefully within the next two years. Right. Well, you have more, uh, you have less distractions now with the coronavirus. So <laughs> while you stay <laughs> at home, you can get inspired to write the book. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I hope to see it soon. Then we have a, a question from Alessio Paoletti. And it is about, uh, let me just uh, summarize it. It's, um, it's about the relationship between these buildings and the cities. Like why were they des designed in the, or situated in the place where they are and how they relate to the city structure? Are, are there any reasons why the buildings are exactly there as they are in the relationship to the surroundings? Yes, thank you. Uh, Alessio, the, um, what I didn't describe, when I showed you the three towers that marched down the street, that first tower was Old City Hall. That sits in this slide uh, just to the uh, west of First Christian Church at the intersection of Fifth Street. You see the white building in the shape of the U, the roof is shaped of the U. Across the street is Old City Hall. So the, the church, which was in 38, which was land granted to the church, uh, actually, in, uh, in 38, that was, uh, that was City Hall property, actually. It had a park with a fountain in the center, sort of a centralized park with a you know, cla standard American neoclassical park with the roses, bushes going around, and a, a Roman fountain in the center, Roman-inspired fountain, uh, was uh, sold to First Christian Church. And so their property, you see that big green space that First Christian has next to the tower, that was a reflecting pool. And it's accessible by the public. So it's, it's, it's lowered into the ground. Uh, but it was really part of the former public park simply 
suppressed a little bit into the ground, which is kind of a brilliant move. It, interestingly, it's the same size as the library plot. Awesome, thank you. The tower and the church make a threshold or gateway between those two significant spaces. So that's why that was there. And the library was there because there was a former library in the site already, which was the Carnegie Library. that library. was uh, re removed and this took its place. So I think it was about joining, making a city center that used the, uh, what is the former city hall as a kind of key point to link out of. All right, thank you, Kelly. We have uh, two more questions. Great. Uh, we have uh, Ting Ting Wu, who is thanking us for the lecture and says, this is a great lecture in the geometry and linking in math really opened my sight to architecture. If each building around is designed by different architects, what other ways they can communicate with each other besides geometry and pattern, perhaps color or shapes? Yes, color, shape, materiality, and something else we didn't talk about very much, which is the linkage of spatial, uh, spatial boundaries to each other, right? Mm -hmm. How an outside space links with inside. If you were inside the uh, First Christian Church and you're walking out of the church down the central aisle and you get into the narthex or lobby, a large window to your right links the statue across the facade as well. Uh, and the spaces that you encounter inside the library make you feel as if uh, there's an extension of the library plaza right into the library itself. The library itself has an addition on the back side of it. It was added by Jim Paris uh, many years later. It's not original to uh, Mr. Pay's scheme. You see it as a horizontal bar behind the library. And uh, that was a terrace that was filled with trees. It was a garden. And so you would look through the plaza and the building and see these trees through it, which was uh, like an oasis or a garden. It was a great metaphor for a library as you saw through it. That's another way in which we link mm -hmm. and uh, uh, build relationships between things. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I was myself quite impressed to see the sequence of movements, uh, uh, perceptual movements along the promenade around the buildings. Now, how basically when you walk uh, next to the library on, on what we see here in the plan, the left side, you see the tower that Jennifer pointed right in front of you. So, you know, it's interesting that buildings are perceived not so much as a static um, impression or static uh, two-dimensional plane, but something that we perceived as we move around it. So this, this is something that I really appreciate about your lecture. And, uh, you know, maybe it will be interesting to explore this in video if someone can, can actually go and, and film how you approach the building, how do you move from one building to another, and to see whether the designer, the architects actually thought about the movement around these, uh, these buildings. Cool, we have another question by Adam van der Houten, and uh, wait, let me get to it. Do you think that some of these architectural visual tools which reveal themselves through a more in-depth exploration of the architecture and its surrounding make the building more beautiful than a quote unquote conventionally good looking buildings. I suspect that things being off center and having no immediate logic tend to irk most architects, but once understood and analyzed as you have, it somehow makes them pleasing to the eye. So I don't know if you have, uh, any reaction to this? I myself think that m most people, when they see contemporary buildings, they think, "Wow, why are they so <laughs> so ugly?" You know, <laughs> for 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 most people, for most people who are not architects, like they are used to having decoration, they're used to having like symmetry, they're used to having sculptures and and uh, uh, and uh, you know fancy materials in front of buildings, and and that's what they their idea of a beautiful building is. And so when they see a new building, they're like, well, I don't really get this, you know? So uh, in, in your lecture, it was really a masterful explanation. We saw a really masterful explanation of how to read and understand buildings better and appreciate it in a deeper way. One of the great lessons of Rome was to stand in front of uh, the Palazzo Farnese facade. And though it's bilaterally symmetrical, 
the windows are very repetitive and the rooms behind those windows inside the building are all different sizes and heights. So the interior rooms do not telegraph their character to the facade at all. Yet there's powerful and dynamic movement vertically and laterally. It has to do with the way in which uh, pediments are, this is then grouped next to a curved one and they go tri uh, triangle, curved triangle, curved triangle, they, or they cross, they go all, the windows go all the way to the very end of the building as if it's gonna fall off the edges. And the way the, uh, was the, the the, 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 each tier, each, each level of the, of the facade was built, there's subtle changes all the way up that cause dynamic, engaging, engrossing, hmm. dynamic movement. And it's often forgotten in symmetrical architecture, a great deal of movement can be animated. When symmetry sucks, or excuse the word, what's no good is when it's merely repetitive or something just merely stacked. And it's kind of, it gets its, uh, it loses its dynamic action. But it's one of those great lessons you pick up uh, from Rome. In a time period of architecture where I tease my students, like, you know, you're gonna have a hard time <laughs> doing symmetry. You're gonna be using asymmetry as a formal system a lot in your projects. And I, I just tease them about it, because of course you can use symmetry with modern architecture, but it's, the, uh, it's a, it's a pre prevalent bias. Yep. We have a few, few more questions and comments. Ari, then Boone. Uh, says, thank you for the great presentation. It opened my eyes to appreciate forms and rhythms further. And then Kim Orebik, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, says, this is so interesting. Have you studied the relationship between the city hall in Joensu and this church? I'm not sure where Joensu is. Uh, the difference is Elio's architecture star the difference in Elio architecture style is clear, but I see so many similarities. Uh, maybe you can tell us where Joensuu is. Uh, it's probably in Finland, if I can guess, because Saarinen is from, oh yeah, it is in Finland, yes. How did I guess? <laughs> Saarinen is from, from uh, yeah. Finland. And, um, and um, you know, the, I, in, to that question, I would, I would add Kelly, when, uh, when we were at the GSD, actually Raphael Monel was talking about this German architect and he was like, do you guys know this guy? And he's like early 20th century architect. And he designed a church which also has two naves, not, not just like three, but has like the central one and mm. then one to the side. Mm. So he, he was like, Monel was like really surprised. He was like, how can you not know about this guy? You know, so he spent like hours talking about this this church, which is in Germany in the, from the 20s. So it's much earlier than this one, all made white and, and has a lot of similarity to this one. It also somehow reminds me to the city hall in Oslo, uh, which is also made out of bricks and also has a huge uh, tower, uh, a clock tower in front of it. So maybe uh, those are uh, some, some other projects to, to see as presence for this one. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not sure if you know this other project that Kim is asking about in Finland. That's uh, also... No, I'm not. I, I, I am aware. I've been made aware of it before, but I, I've not okay. been there. I know I've not been there to see it. And Michael Connell is asking, is there a time to ask one more question? Sure. Uh, let's ask one more question and, and maybe uh, that could be the last one because... Um, it's uh, Kelly's a busy man, and so <laughs> we want to let him do his work today. So yes, yeah, go I, ahead, I, go ahead, I appreciate Michael. the generosity of this. Um, I can't help but notice that we're talking about a relationship, an intentional relationship between a public building and what I'll call a quasi-public or private, between a religious building and, and a library, sort of these monuments to, to reason. Do you think that was at play here in, in saying, look, this is a public square and at either end of it is civic and religious? Um, have you given that any thought? Uh, the, well, let's see, how do I think? I, well, one of the things you'll notice about the library facade, if I can, I wonder if I can find a slide to get me there. Um, sorry for this quick, there we go. Is that 
in, uh, when you walk up to this building, what happens is you see clean through, especially at twilight when the lights are on inside. And it's to remind you that the American large holding public library system was invented by the United States in 1911 with the Boston Public Library. And it was one of these ideas about uh, for an architecture firming up a fundamental contract in the United States, which is that all of us are promised the pursuit of happiness in the United States. Access to power by way of knowledge is your right as an American. And so we put, we made our public libraries palaces to the people, which was the McKinley and White job of the Boston Public Library. And it has one of the best stair sequences known architecture inside of it because of that reason. So when you look at this building, it takes you right in, then you see this garden, this light at the end. The church, that's a facade. It says, careful when you walk through me because of what's on the other side of my surface. It's kind of really interesting. Now that a sacred object, a sacred place and a profane space are across from each other, it's not, well, in a European context, particularly Italy, it would be not unusual to have a uh, piazza that has a church related to it. They all had some kind of space attached to it where other civic, less religious buildings are also grouped around it. So it has that. And it's important to realize that this church has a clock on its tower, not a cross. That's a civic gift at the top. And uh, part of the argument I like to make about the church's design and the interior, which is that this, uh, we're not showing you the west wall, that's the east wall on the left-hand side of the church. And that's the um, the, the, the north facing wall that has the cross on it. So the west wall uh, has a row of tall windows where there is no side aisle. And when you're inside that church, you tend to feel the courtyard, the adjacent wing of the uh, school, which is the wall, which bounds the space, helps make it. The great wall of windows that bounds the space on the west side from the church, uh, uh, basilica, and then the lower wall, which is the guard wall, that ends with the punctuation point of the tower, which is a clock in it. And part of that is to link the inside of the church to the, through the school wing to the tower to make you mindful of your three responsibilities in life. <laughs> One, to the interior life of your person, your soul, and inside the church. Two, that we're responsible to educate our children. And third, uh, which is what that clock is doing there, that we're responsible to our communities. That linked church to state. We're not supposed to do that in the United States. We separate church to state, but in the hands of a brilliant architect and a great artist, you can solve contradictions like that. And I find it beautiful. It's a roundabout way of answering your question. <laughs> no, that's a perfect answer. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, so we have a comment from Tom Hackley who says, I think it will be interesting to explore the IM Pace talks about the previous buildings and its architect, which was on the site. Architects are not people, small egos. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <right>. yeah. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so here was a young <laughs> IM Pei. Yet they seem to respect very famous architect of others. <laughs> very good building across the street. God I didn't think about what he was thinking, which was how do I pay my respects to this to Elio Saren and challenge equal him? Uh, well, that's a narrow window to hit, and I thought he hit it, Pay. But mm -hmm. many of these moves I'm describing are really a consequence of what, what Pay's hand did. Mm -hmm. I you know when when I look at this building, particularly the church, which I find absolutely impressive for the time where it was built. It, it makes me wonder whether he visited Siena in uh, Piazza del oh, Popolo, sure uh, Pia the, the, the Piazza del Popolo in, in Siena, with yeah, this tower. huge tower, you know, yeah. which, which always struck me as being so disproportional in relationship to the building that's below it. You know, it's just like so big. If you look at any of the towers in, in Florence, for example, the Palazzo Vecchio, no, the tower is much smaller than the building. So. Uh, Piazza del Campo, sorry. Uh, Piazza del Campo. Thanks, Alessio. Piazza del Campo in Siena. Uh, and and uh, so, you know, that tower actually charges the square and, and it creates that public space in front of it because, you know, the building, if there wasn't for the tower, the building would kind of look small for that huge plaza. But because it has a tower, it actually charges that space and, and makes it even more monumental. And here, the dialogue between the two, it's quite interesting because 
you know, we see this rather light facade because if I if I would guess, this is probably glass or or alabaster. I don't know what the stone. Oh, it's a uh, limestone. Oh, it's a limestone in the facade. Okay, so yeah. it you know it looks quite visually much lighter, and then we have the huge tower. So actually, the 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 kind of the dialogue between the two charge the space between the two of them in charge the space of the plaza in front of them. So it's a very very masterful uh, design. So um, yeah, so I don't I don't see any other questions or comments. So. Uh, with that, um, I would like to thank our guests for, for coming to our masterclass and particularly Professor, I would like to thank Professor Kelly Wilson for his time and for his generous presentation. It was uh, such a great opportunity to learn something new and to develop new skills on reading and understanding buildings and appreciating them in ways that we couldn't do before. So. Uh, I hope we'll continue this conversation further. And um, Kelly, if you have any closing thoughts, now would be a, a great time. Well, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, uh, do this through Build Academy, uh, Yvonne. And, uh, and it's really great to see a few old faces, particularly Alan. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. And for, for our guests, I invite you to see what we have at Build Academy. We have actually two courses on modern architecture. They go from early 20th century until the 80s. And I have another course on contemporary architecture from the 80s until today. So you will see a variety of really extraordinary buildings and uh, be able to, to understand them and appreciate them much better and expand your culture about architecture, design, and art. So that's buildacademy.com. We will have more presentations like this in the following weeks. Now that we are under quarantine, uh, you know, people have some more time to, to talk about architecture and to listen conversations about it. So I will uh, keep you posted and I'll send you uh, a link for this lecture in case you wanna share it with someone else or if, if you wanna look at it again. And um, with that, uh, thank you all. I hope you are uh, well and staying safe and 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 the coronavirus doesn't reach you <laughs> and and if it does i hope that you uh heal soon and architecture in a moment like this is something that we appreciate even further because it's actually what protects us from the elements but also protects us from uh the virus so if it wasn't for our buildings we would be in a much uh, worse position so uh, I think we now get to appreciate them more from the inside instead of from the outside, at least. So uh, with that, I wish you all a wonderful week and I will be in touch with you for any other events and uh, lectures that we have in the future. If you have any questions for either me or uh, Professor Kelly Wilson, please uh, email us and we'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well and be safe. Take care. Ciao.